Hello, everyone. For the past 12 years, the SNF Nostos Conference has served as a crossroads for exploring a wide array of impactful themes. From dissecting the synergy between humanity and artificial intelligence to probing the role of philanthropy amid global disruption, our journey has been broad and insightful. We've explored the pillars of democracy, the power of creativity, and the crucial importance of ethical spaces in our ever-polarizing societies. We've cast our gaze over the Mediterranean and Balkan regions, examining their distinct geopolitical challenges. We've explored sustainable education, health, artistic commitment, and social welfare, always with an eye towards solutions. And we, let not forget our focus, this year on the future, on young people seeking new pathways to empower and uplift them in a rapidly changing world. Its theme, unique on its own, threads together in a tapestry of our shared human experience. And this year, we pull on a thread that woven through every discussion we've had, mental health. Our third history, and very long collaboration with Chatham House, for which we at SNF are very proud, finds a new manifestation today. You are about to take part in a conversation that will shed light on the critical mental health issues amplified by today's global challenges. The session title is Reshaping Priorities, Addressing Mental Health in the Age of Crisis. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel to the stage, starting with Bronwyn Maddox, Director and CEO of Charam House, Saima Wazed, Advisor of the Director General of Mental Health and Autism of the World Health Organization, Valentina Yemi, LSE Fellow at the Department of Health Policy, London School of Economics and uh, Political Science, and Jennifer Utsedu, Founder of Sasti Vibes. Please. Join Miller, also Chief Law Enforcement and Intelligence Analyst at CNN, and Marvin Krislov, President of Pace University, will also join the discussion. Enjoy. Anna, thank you so much and a very warm welcome to you all here. And let me just say how excited I am to be here. I'm so pleased that the Stavros Niakis Foundation is devoting this conference to mental health, and I've been really inspired by the sessions I've heard already. I have a terrific panel here today to discuss polycrisis, that word that has become fashionable even, to, de to describe the enormous uncertainty that we are living through in many, many countries. And what we're talking about today is the effect of all that uncertainty and these different crises on mental health, particularly that of young people. We've had, obviously, in affecting many countries, a spike in the cost of living food and energy that is putting a lot of strain on many, many households and individuals. We have wars breaking out, we have displacement of people inside their own countries and across borders. And of course, we are only just out of the pandemic. I'm thinking of a headline of an editorial in the Times of London this morning, talking about the impact of the pandemic on younger people and saying with a lot of anger and force, the kids are not all right. So these are the kind of themes we're talking about, and I've asked the panel to think about two things. What, what has the impact been? What is the impact of these times that we're living in? And then what we might reach for as answers to that, whether it is from governments or international organizations or from civil society. And we have the panel here, and we're going to have two interventions as well from the audience, but I hope you're all thinking of your questions here or on the app um, for later when we come to that. So let me start, we have a lot to talk about. Let me start with Jennifer, who has been working on the impact 
on mental health of younger people, particularly of issues around climate change in Nigeria and across the global south. And she's going to tell us about that. Jennifer. Thanks a lot, Bowen. Um, I think it's really important that we first start to understand that we live in a sick planet, but we're also sick people, right? You talked about the poly crisis, the fact that economic issues, geographical crisis, you know, environmental and social issues are happening everywhere all at once. And it's really difficult, especially for young people. There's heightened anxiety because we don't know what the future holds. And we see that governments are just not prioritizing, not just issues of mental health, but of other issues, whether it's social, climate change. And I think in my work in the past three years, I've dedicated a lot of my time understanding the impact of the climate crisis on mental health of young people. We're seeing that this is no longer just a mental distress and just a passing thought. We have young people like myself, because I have lived experience of eco-anxiety, who are feeling extremely powerless, extremely numb, extremely hopeless in the face of the crisis. It is difficult to talk about hope when you put in all of the realities that we have. Lots are happening and there isn't so much hope that we can you know, grapple with. A good example is in Nigeria. Last year, we had floods that were so bad, over 600 people died. Over 1 million people were displaced and these people were families, children, young people who we typically call the future of tomorrow. How do you have the future of tomorrow grappling with displacement? How do you have them grappling with deparatization, especially when it comes to climate issues? We have young people in the global south and across the world who are deciding they don't want to have children. So that is our reality. Healing is important and we really need to talk about and have spaces like this where we talk about the impacts of this crisis on people's mental health. Research is critical, but also defining the problem, the fact that there's equal anxiety, there's climate-related anxiety, there's a mental health impact on young people, and it's difficult to dream, it's difficult to hope, it's difficult to think of a better future. And these are the change makers. You know, I'm a climate activist, and I had at a, at a point in my life where I did not want to do this work anymore because I didn't see a path forward. Governments weren't prioritizing this issue, and this is, you know, the bleak reality. Thank you. Jennifer, thanks very much indeed. That's terrific. And I'm going to come back at, um, when we start talking about solutions. Actually, your point about activism there and whether that is actually one of the answers of giving people a sense of what they can do about it. Perhaps we'll come back to that later. Valentina, your research, which is extensive, uh, is, is on this kind of thing. And I wondered if you could give us some of your findings on it. Yes, definitely. Uh, thank you, Bernan. We see that these multiple crises are really having a critical impact, a dramatic impact, both in our mental health, but also in our societies and in our economies. When we're thinking about these multiple crises, we're thinking about changing living conditions, worsening living conditions. And those such as unemployment, financial difficulties, and those are all factors that put us under extensive pressure and increase our likelihood to develop some mental health conditions. And if we have poor mental health, we are less likely to participate into our societies and in, into our economies. Imagine we are in a house, we are experiencing multiple earthquakes, our bodies are shaking, and our minds are shaking too. So I give you an example, which is uniting all of us of COVID-19. During the pandemic, we saw multiple governments having different policy responses with very different socioeconomic consequences. Most of us experience social isolations 
and some of us experience unemployment. Those are all factors that increase the likelihood to have mental health condition. And during the pandemic, we saw that. We saw an increase in referral to mental health services. We saw an increase in prescription of drugs for mental health conditions, such as depression and anxiety. And we don't only see this strain in the health sector, sector but we also saw this into our economies. People were less productive because of their poor mental health. Now, as Bruno mentioned, we're experiencing a high increase in the economic inflation, which means higher food prices, higher energy prices, and it's putting additional strain in, a, in our mental health. So we do have multiple crises, interacting crises, all having an impact on our mental health and on our society and the economy at large. And we do need governments to act on it. Thank you very much. Let me ask you one thing, uh, perhaps whether youth unemployment is a particular factor in mental health, whether your research has looked at that. So we do have evidence on youth unemployment and if we're taking the, um, the example of COVID, COVID affected disproportionately young people and especially young people that were entering into the job market. Not only because th these young people lost their relationship, their interaction with their peers, but also because there was a freeze in jobs. So all of a the sudden, their life opportunities disappeared. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for that. I find it's hard to clap holding a microphone. Or well, it's going to lead to disaster, but I don't want to stop you from clapping. Simon, let me move on to you. And you have such a lot of perspective on this, a country experience advising the WHO. Um, I, I've, I have all kinds of questions I, I could ask, but I wonder if you could just give us your, your first overall thoughts on this. Well, thank you um, for that, and it's you know, really incredible to be here and listening from this morning, all of the discussions and the really changing viewpoint on, on mental health and how we are approaching it, how we are researching it as having you know, advocates. The whole pers land you know, field of mental health has really changed. And in many ways, COVID, as was you know, said earlier this morning, has really brought to the forefront how important mental wellness is, but also how many different things really impact it. You know, it isn't just about whether it's a physical health condition. It isn't just about um, financial crisis that you're dealing with. It isn't simply about family discord that you're having. We as mental health practitioners always were aware there were many factors that are involved that ends up causing somebody to experience a mental health crisis, right? And we would be stuck in this profession, and I say that as a practitioner where we're treating one person and just by themselves and unable to address any of the other factors that are involved. But now, you know, 30 years later in my profession, we see that the conversation has changed. And we realize that one thing isn't enough. Yes, the person is really important and you have to help the person to help them develop the necessary coping mechanism, the skills, the way they think, the way they behave, and all of that that's in the treatment process. But we also realize these, there are other real factors, factors that are about survival, factors that are about belonging in a society, belonging in the family, factors that involve employment, opportunities, physical health. All of that has 
what were sort of these theoretical concepts that we had, that we understood, are now in the forefront. Now we're in real time getting evidence. And it's actually a wonderful opportunity because the field of mental health really needs to change. We started as a profession, you know, from philosophy and in medical science, we, we've kind of been stuck in a certain way of treating it like a disease. And it really doesn't fit that model. You know, it is a health condition, but it doesn't quite fit the way we have traditionally treated health conditions. And so we have to kind of look at a whole person with every aspect of their life and then try to help them move forward and become a lot more balanced as a person, but also fitting in to the society that they belong to, that they need to belong to. And I think COVID and the isolation that we experienced um, as individuals, as even, you know, our communities and societies and even countries, we realize that we, we're not isolated people. We are human beings. We need each other. You know, we, as people, we need each other. As countries, we need each other. And so we cannot have uh, isolation and actually afford to be healthy. That is at the core purpose. So if we're going to address mental health, we have to go forward and do it together, address all of those issues in combination. It's a really interesting point that you're making about um, the way the pandemic changed our perspectives on this kind of thing. Um, because obviously we all know the old um, history of treating uh, mental health, which in fact goes back uh, centuries, but the, 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 uh, the, the, even the past hundred years of looking at talking therapies and then more uh, investigation of medication and so on. But what you're describing about is, um, if you like, a third wing on top of that, of looking at the context in which someone is living. Is, have, I, have I caught what you're... The first of what you're saying. Absolutely, context what we're living, but uh, you know, at the core, one fundamental part that we miss and that we've only now sort of begun to touch the surface of is um, experiential, experience of trauma, you know, traumatic experience in whatever form it is, whether it's your own personal, whether it's from loss uh, or it's like this global phenomenon. The, traumatic experience that you have that we do know is also passed on from one generation to the other, um, not just by neurological information that is passed on, which is like organic biological, but also because it's learned behavior. We grew up in, in families and we learn the coping skills. So if our uh, if generation that is teaching us has unhealthy coping skills, we're also learning those unhealthy coping skills. And so, there is a huge gap in our understanding, I think, of what comprises a healthy uh, person overall. And we've gotten into this pattern of, you know, we do need the diagnosis, we need the labels to understand it. But what does that person actually need? I mean, we need it as a profession. We need it from the health point of view. But what is it that that person needs to function better in society as a productive and happy individual. Thank you. <laughs> Jennifer, I wanted to come back to a point you made that I was very struck by about hope. And you said part of the strain of the world that we're in at the moment uh, is that it can deprive people of hope. They have no sense of control, therefore they can't plan for their futures. Their plans they make get, get you know, smashed aside. Um, it could be by a flood, it could be by war or displacement. And it deprives them of that sense of, of, of control and looking at their own future. Um, do you see that in your work on quite a lot of fronts, not just about climate? And what do you see as some of the antidotes to that? Absolutely. Um, I think young people, well, I work with young people, so my experience has been with youths in Africa, Global South. We are more connected than ever before, so we see everything happening, you know, in different parts of the world. Really important point. Yeah, and the reality of that is that it starts to stifle hope, right? Especially when you see that you don't always have a fighting chance. And I think for us in Africa, it's worse because the vulnerabilities are heightened when it comes to corruption, when it comes to, you know, economic issues, injustices. We see, you know, the brunt of this um, oppression, as it were, in our reality. You see how, for example, 
climate crisis can impact food security and impact your life on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think the reality for young people is that it's difficult to dream. And I think dreaming and hoping, they're very important and essential for you know, balanced and productive society. And we see that in our work. We see young people who are climate activists also talking about the politics of the issue, the economics of the issue, because they're all interconnected, right? And that is why the poly crisis becomes even more important to look at. It's how everything is connected and how it impacts a young person, you know, from the school, from the childhood, you know, everything, you know, just being together and impacting one person at the same time. Thank you for that. I think you, you've absolutely put, you put your finger on something that we live in very political times. People are really, uh, not party political, but people are trying to put words to the frustrations, the fears they, they feel and how they want to be uh, governed and led in the future. I want to call now on uh, the first of our interventions. I'm going to call on uh, Marvin Krislov, who's president of Pace University. And I believe, but I could be surprised, that he is going to make some points from his own experience about the impact of the pandemic on younger people and students. Marvin, very warm welcome. Thank you very much. I'm Marvin Krislov. I'm president of Pace University, which is a multi-campus university in New York, famous for uh, being a leader in, in upward mobility, particularly among children of immigrants and, and also first-generation college goers. Even before the pandemic, we saw a dramatic increase in the number of students seeking help for mental health challenges, and COVID has exacerbated that. Particularly, um, I sat on the Steve Fund Task Force, which focused on students of color, and they found that, that students of color were far less likely to seek help than their counterparts. And we've tried a lot of things. We've tried peer mentoring. We've tried the use of technology, partnering with groups like Radical Health and, and so forth. And we found that although there is some impact, there's still a lot of needs. And one of the things that, that I would love to have the panel's uh, wisdom on is how to reach students who are dropping out at significant rates and also high schoolers who are also um, just disappearing. And so the concern is, are we going to have a lost generation of students who are not completing their education, not entering the workforce in the ways they might have? And I, I'm wondering if there are ways that the panel might suggest for government, philanthropy, and educators to work on identifying and bringing those students the help that they might need. Thank you very much indeed. And there, Marvin has put an emphasis on, on the particular impact on students and students' mental health, which I think will resonate with a lot of people here. I now want to call on the second intervention, John Miller of CNN, uh, the Chief Law Enforcement and Intelligence Analyst for C CNN, who has some wider and I think quite surprising points about the effect particularly of the pandemic on mental health. Thank you. Thanks um, to SNF for having me and to Anna for the for the entire event and Bronwyn for wrangling this conversation and keeping it on track. As a former counterterrorism and intelligence official for the New York City Police Department, the Los Angeles Police Department, the FBI, we're often confronting the question is, what is the relationship between pathways to violence and mental illness? Now, before we go any further, it's always important to note that mental illness does not equate with violence. Um, as Harold Koplowitz, who spoke this morning, reminded me earlier, people even suffering from severe mental illness are far more likely to harm themselves than anybody else. But that aside, looking at the anomalies that we've seen, we have seen some pathways to violence coming together, and we have seen the COVID crisis as a bit of a driver of that, as particularly adolescents were locked up at home, going to school on computer, and then spending their afternoon with the computer as their playground and delving into unexpected and dark places. If you think about it from an American context, the list of names is really nearly endless. You're talking about Peyton Gendry, who used an assault weapon, um, driving 200 miles across the suburbs of upper New York State to 
opened fire on black shoppers in Buffalo in a supermarket, or the young woman who returned to her grammar school in Nashville, Tennessee and opened fire on small children, or the high school student who was due to graduate the next day who showed up at a school in Uvalde and attacked grammar school children. I mean, these stories repeat themselves in that we are seeing more active shooters or mass shootings than we are seeing days in the year. And to translate that to Europe, where they are not as mad um, and gun crazy as Americans, we see it in the form of knife attacks in Great Britain or Paris, ramming attacks with vehicles. And COVID has been a driver. So if you look at the more organized form of terrorism, we see mental illness as a recurring factor in a very interesting way. While mental illness is just one of the many vulnerabilities that may draw people to organized extremism, it's clearly not the cause. Radicalization happens when an individual comes to accept the ideology of us against them and a war to the end and against some perceived existential threat. But some studies have given us important clues. Two studies, one American and one European, show that the majority of terrorists recruited as part of a group operation showed no history of psychopathology. They were far more likely to be motivated by group dynamics, external factors, but a European study of lone wolf attackers, it was discovered that 43% had a history of mental illness. The odds of a lone actor, a lone wolf attacker, having some diagnosed form of mental illness were actually 14 times higher than the odds of a group actor having that. So collectively, it seems to suggest on the back end of the COVID crisis, under the backdrop of the terrorism we've all lived with in the post 9-11 world, that we need some more thoughts on how organizations who are not a natural fit, law enforcement, intelligence, mental health providers, NGOs, social services, how they can work together. So what are some thoughts on how law enforcement and intelligence agencies can work together with a greater focus on mental health opportunities for intervention, especially in the before, or as, or as the Brits call it, the prevent strategy, uh, where the signs are early enough to get in front of the behavior that could end badly, not just for the actor, but for victims in the wake. Thank you. Don't, don't rush away, because I want to ask you something. Um, thank you very much indeed for that. And there was a lot of really interesting things you've woven together there. I want to be clear on what you're saying. You're saying that mental illness um, drives some kind, or is found disproportionately in some kinds of terrorism, particularly that lone wolf actors, if you like, but not so much in, in organized. Uh, terrorism, and therefore at times of rising mental illness, you might expect, is, is this the, the causal relationship you're suggesting? I, I would say you that might in times more. of crisis, COVID yeah. being an example, yeah. yes. um, that, um, that people with vulnerabilities who are searching um, can be drawn into these things because the people who organize the propaganda that, that attract people to extremism, and it doesn't matter if it's mm -hmm. ISIS, or neo-Nazi white power extremism, um, the marketing of it is quite sophisticated, mm -hmm. and it's all about you can be a part of this. And for those who are isolated, it's a strong sell. We, but on crime, non-terrorist crime, you were saying that uh, people with mental illness are more likely to injure, injure themselves, and, and that, that there was a less strong, if I've understood you rightly, a less strong link there. You weren't saying that mental illness drives Correct. Crime patterns quickly. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the clarification. Great. And John there at the end began to su suggest some ways uh, in which the, in the particular world in which he's talking about, uh, we might begin to look for solutions. Like some of these agencies, uh, who, as he put it, don't normally work together, beginning to work together and understand more clearly what the patterns of uh, uh, the impact of mental uh, illness and ill health uh, might be on the wider phenomena that they're, they're looking at. That's why, partly why I pressed him on the, uh, the links and the patterns he was talking about. Well, that 
serves as a perfect pivot to talk into the second bite that we're going to have at all this about what things we might do. And by we, I really do mean that in the wider sense. We as individuals, we are within our families, our workplaces, our countries, what we might want uh, our governments, uh, other organizations to do. Um, so, Jennifer, I'm not asking for any uh, ringing, definitive, single account of this, because this is such a complex question. But where would you start with your preferences of the kind of answers you'd like to see to the problems you were describing? That's a tough question, because I wish we had all of the answers. But I do think we need to move away from the current status quo of just doing and fixing and solutions and think of regeneration and healing and rest and slowing down. I think we need to start to think of values around compassion, purpose, service, joy, and hope and bring it into formal conversations and settings like this because they're crucial, especially if we think of ourselves as individuals, parts of communities and families. And I think more research obviously needs to be done on the impact of this intersecting crisis on people's mental health, especially in the global south. Now you see a lot of research happening in the UK and in the US, but what about the global south? What about communities and countries who are even more impacted by this issue. So I think it's really important that research focuses on that and that it goes from a lived experience point of view. And what that means is that local researchers are empowered with the right finance to do this work and that you know, we start to see this issue from a more sort of contextual point of view. And then finally, I think it's important to empower local community-based interventions and NGOs who are doing this work you know, across communities and learn from them, learn from local wisdom, indigenous practices, you know, spiritual ways of healing, and really start to think of alternatives. Um, one scholar once said, maybe we need to pause and think, are we actually the crisis? And you know, part of the problem as it were. So maybe we need to pause, reflect, and think of some alternative ways of doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jennifer, how would you begin to tackle this admittedly very large question I have asked you? The answer. Hmm. Uh, sorry, sorry, Valentina, sorry. Um, yes, it's indeed a very difficult <laughs> question to answer. And I like the idea, as Jennifer said, to slow it down. Um, I believe that governments needs to adopt an approach that is investing in mental health and integrating mental health across multiple sectors. In my 15 years of experience as a researcher, I really saw that the most gain in mental health are not in the healthcare sectors, that are in other sectors. So if we are thinking about uh, we were talking about financial strains. If the government is addressing financial strains, that people are more likely to have good mental health. Then if people with mental health condition receive support in the workplace, they are more likely to stay and to be part of societies. Same for children. If children with mental health conditions, such as anxiety or depression, receive the support they need at school, they are more likely to stay in school. They are more likely to enjoy learning. And this is a tremendous effect on their life opportunities later on. So government needs really to adopt this broad view and this integration of mental health across all sectors if they want better society, mentally healthy society, which means societies where people have better well-being, where people are more productive, so better economies, but also societies that later on would be more resilient to future crises. 
So if you thinking about the metaphor that I used before about the house shaking, you don't want to change and adapt yourself to a house that is shaking. You want to change the house and build a better house. Thank you very much indeed. It's a really interesting point what governments themselves can do and there's a lot of attention this week in the UK on this because of interest rates going up yet again in a, in a society that has um, even prided itself on having a lot of home ownership. This is causing real fear uh, along a lot of people, a lot of the newspapers this week concentrating very much on that. At the same time, I've noticed much more willingness among senior figures uh, in government and other institutions to talk about mental health. I'm thinking the head of the uh, British Army, General Sir Patrick Sanders, talking about his own uh, questions of mental health and, 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 and trying to get rid of that taboo. And uh, things like that from, if you like, unexpected places. The Army is not somewhere until confronted with um, real problems of mental health and people. Uh, it, it's it's uh, soldiers taking their own lives in some cases, uh, forced to you know look hard at this. So those things do make a big a big difference. Leadership at that kind of level. Simon, what what are your feelings about this as we begin to just explore um, solutions or way, it, it, if not perfect solutions, things that could be done to improve things. Thank you. Um, actually, I have, I have a really good example of how we could improve things. Uh, we've been very fortunate. Um, that the, for the last decade or so I've been working in Bangladesh in um, uh, Southeast Asia region and really learning uh, as I go along. <clears throat> and like I said, you know, in this, uh, this last 15 years or so, we've had so much information that has been out there. Bangladesh has been selected as one of the WHO special initiatives for mental health. And that really gave uh, my organization, Shuchana Foundation and I, the opportunity to really hunker down and address this, not just to sort of uh, understand what is going on and theorize about it and advocate for it, but actually designed a very comprehensive strategic plan on how we can possibly address it in a very you know, complex situation where we don't have enough resources, we don't have enough resource persons, we don't really have the sort of commitment uh, um, so how, how can we actually do it in a developing country with the situation that we have towards it? So our strategic uh, plan uh, cuts across all of the different sectors. So it starts with health. We've got education. We've got women and, and children's ministry. We've got ministry for disaster planning and management. And what we did uh, with uh, our colleagues, with input from people with lived experience, people with experts that are working, with academicians and experts from WHO, we sat together and designed this uh, uh, very comprehensive plan that identifies across you know, 31 uh, sections like what could be done as a first step. Who would be the potential partners in the country, as well as where would the potential resources come? Then identifying what are the specific things that are missing. Is it human resource that's missing here? Is it advocacy that needs to be done here? Is it actual sort of training and resource persons that have to be developed? And when I'm talking about resource persons, I'm not just talking about mental health experts. No, I'm not talking about psychiatrists and psychologists, but actually what, who can work at the community level. So, we, we had opportunities to develop, okay, to give input on adolescent health program. Can we incorporate information that's mental health related that say teachers could be talking about within the curriculum? And yes, we did that. Could we have teacher training opportunities that sort of addresses uh, mental health in a very benign kind of way? Like what can teachers not do to uh, aggravate a situation, what can teachers do to identify a potential um, a child who, who's experiencing issues. So we incorporated that as well, um, along with really also within a community-based mental health infrastructure, 
who can help. So we have these wonderful sort of programs that we call like where they go within in the villages, within homes, and just sort of educational programming. So we've got the, these aren't very highly educated. Uh, a lot of them times they're women. They're women living in the community. They're volunteers. They they learn different techniques and educate on nutrition. Sometimes it's about breastfeeding. So there are different programs we've done. They've done awareness on vaccination. We consider them as very skilled professionals, really, in the community, teaching them about what they could do to, in order to help build up a resilient community, to seek help when it's needed, to support one another what's needed, when it's needed, using this sort of like the realities of our country situation. I think we've done a tremendous job of designing a plan that's low cost, that's sustainable, that is part of the, you know, health and social development structure. So it's something that can be embedded within the program because I think the way to address mental health is as, as ambitious as we want to be, we have to see the reality of what a country can do. You know, if we want to go to a certain place, we have to see where we are and go start really step by step. So th to me, th this plan, as comprehensive and daunting as it may be to, to a policy expert, it's actually just, just the beginning, but it's the right beginning. It's what will lead to the next step. Um, and, you know, with the, the, the pandemic, it sort of jump-started because in many ways the advocacy part no longer is almost needed. It's like, okay, we, we know it's important <laughs> because we all experience it. Now tell us what to do. So it's jump-started it, and I think it's really a, a good time to address it in a way that countries can do it. Because if we are talking about countries where they have one mental health expert for the entire country, how are you going to really bring everybody um, to get that support? So you, you have to sort of prevent and identify and build resilience, B do that at the level where people really are. Use sort of the cultural context. And, uh, you know, for, for Bangladeshis, we look for family as support. Sometimes that can actually be more harmful because they don't really know how to help or what to say. But can we change that conversation? Can we make those support persons understand how to say something helpful and healthy and not say something that can cause more harm. You know, particularly when it comes to you know, gender identity ex issues, sexuality, that's, that's a huge problem. There's a lot of religious and social connotations uh, against that. So we have to kind of change that conversation and needlessly, you know, um, not n needlessly cause people to go towards into a more painful situation and uh, end up having a condition just simply because they don't feel like they fit in or they feel like they're going against their social and religious norms. So I, I, I believe that that's a good way to really start addressing the whole issue. Really interesting what you're saying uh, about the degree of change that's going on in thinking. And, and some of the things you were saying uh, show how mental health also touches on aspects of physical health and uh, nutrition and, and it, it's about bringing someone along, all this. But I'm really interested in your point that the pandemic has, has jump-started, to use your word, um, some, some thoughts about how to, how to help people live in a more resilient way. Um, Jennifer, may I come back to you? Because resilience is one of the, it's really at the heart of this session. We're talking about the particular strains of the uncertain world we live in at the moment with these big forces that everyone is grappling with, different ones in different, different countries. And I wondered what your thoughts were about trying to help people um, develop resilience, um, not just mental resilience, but of, you know, of, of, of response to these, these these thoughts in their life planning, their attitude to their lives. Absolutely. I really, really believe that resilience is about agency, how people see themselves, their ability. The feeling to... of having agency, exactly. of having control. Yeah. Exactly, how they are able to act. And for a very long time, mental health interventions have always been a us versus them 
approach where you treat someone, you help someone. I think we need to start to look at it from a place of solidarity, where we work together with people and share experiences. So more storytelling, less of the diagnosis and treatment you know, pathways, more storytelling, more helping, reflecting, talking together with people, I think can be useful to build that sense of agency. And I think young people in particular don't want, always want to be told what to do. You know, they want to also be listened to and their emotions be validated, be allowed to lead and not to be tokenized for a very long time, whether it's in the um, climate crisis, environmental issues, we've been tokenized for a very long time. How about you listen to our ideas, our solutions, and give us opportunities to lead so that we can hold people res um, accountable in more you know, ways that build our resilience? I think that can be really useful. Really good point. So, Valentina, the powerful cry there for, uh, uh, from younger people being listened to and uh, a desire for agency in this world that can otherwise feel very uncontrollable. Um, I'd like to ex explore with you and, and, and really all of you what you think governments or international organizations might do, because we're here, this tremendous conference has been called, we, uh, indeed, people are listening um, to this. What is the kind of change that we might want to see there, either in what individual governments do or in what they do together? Yeah. Um, I must start, Salma, and then I leave it. Um, I think it's absolutely key to, for policymakers, for politicians to prioritize mental health. And we saw in yesterday's uh, speech, we spoke about how, and we listened about how important is leadership, political leadership, in shifting norms, in shifting the way we're thinking about mental health and we're acting to address mental health issues. And this is absolutely key. We think we need to shift from thinking about health conditions to thinking about in healthy environments and mental health. And one technical way to do it is reallocate the budget. So thinking about financing not only the health system and putting money into the health system, but also putting money for mental health in, um, we saw the militaries, uh, in the economy, in employment, in education, and so on and rebuilding our houses. Thank you for that. Simon, do you have more thoughts on that? And I'm pushing particularly for the kind of, uh, the, the, the government and the, the international organization level, and you spend um, part of your packed life um, talking to such organizations. Well, um, I think what governments really need to do regarding mental health is, in, in addition to what my panelists have said, is think of it from a point of view of human rights and empowerment. You know, governments put a lot of effort into education and into employment, into creating all of this other support. Why? Because they want the population to be more empowered. You know, it's the human rights. But when we talk about mental health, they don't think of it. They don't look at it from that same lens. I think the moment they change, shift the way they look at it and they see mental health as a human right issue, as a mechanism for empowerment of individuals, then the, the solutions would be much, much more clearer and it would all make sense. I think rather than just looking at it as oh, it's a health kind of condition. It isn't. It's a human right issue. It's about empowerment. So how do we empower individuals? And um, if I may, I have a small point on international organization. And to go back to international organization, again, leadership is key. And we have been seeing an increase in political leadership in international organization. If we're thinking about the UN last year, we had a resolution for mental health by the United Nations Security Council. This would have been unthinkable 10 years ago. Really good point, thank you. 
Right, we are now going to come to questions, and so empowering uh, everyone uh, to, to, to ask them. And so could I call up on stage Maria Andrakopoulou from the Youth Advisory Committee, who is going to orchestrate the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for such an insightful and gripping discussion. I would like to kick off the Q&A with a personal question. How can we ensure that mental health services reach out young people in remote and underserved areas, considering the additional barriers posed by crises like the pandemic, climate change and inflation? Thanks. Who would like to start? Well, I think the only way to reach out to young people is to reach them through the mediums that they are most familiar with. Um, and thankfully, they're very, very proficient at it. Uh, we're in the generation that needed to have a lot of face-to-face -face conversations. And thankfully, the newer generations don't need that. And there are many, many mediums that are much more accessible, much more easier for them. And we have to really utilize those and use the most sort of benign way, easiest way that they can. And, and, and that's how we reach them. Con conversing with them at, at their level. Um, another thing is, you know, we tend to, young people tend to listen to other young people. I mean, I, I wish they'd listen more to us older people, but you know, <laughs> it is what it is. And so if we also give them that skill, we, like the youth and masters that we have, you know, we give you the right tools and right skills so that you can help each other. That's going to go a long, long way. I could just add to that, and thank you, Sam, absolutely spot on, to say mental health needs to be mainstreamed. So because it's not mainstreamed, it becomes an other conversation, and accessibility becomes difficult. When it's mainstreamed, you know, everyone wants to learn more about this, learn more about tools, and we begin to help each other, especially looking at it from the point of view that we're sick people in a sick planet. We need to help each other. Yep. Thank you very much for your answer. The next question comes from SNF Nostos Up. As the world seems to be in a continuous crisis mode, what would you recommend is the best strategy to keep sane and prevent our children, as well as our own minds and bodies from constantly shaking? Constantly shaking. Who wants to start? Yes. Um, a very difficult one, and I think a very much link to what we say before about children and youth accessing services, definitely. Uh, there is no easy answer, again, it's about building mentally healthy environment and prioritizing mental health of people, of children, of our families, of our loved ones. and. And one way to do it and to make sure to protect our children is to give them a voice when this voice really matter. And a good example is the participation of youth in decision making. And we see youth participating more and more in decision making, for example, at global level. Um, we know that mental health is a priority for young people. And, for example, in 2021, at the G7, the youth group had a, made a statement and included mental health in the statement. They were trying to push government to act more on mental health at a higher level. So, giving people, giving youth, the voice to set the priorities and to change. Yeah, I could just add to that by saying, I think we stay sane by slowing down. We live in such a world that is capitalist, growth-minded. Our idea of success is doing profit, and that has an impact on our mental health. Maybe we need to rethink our system of the world in terms of what success really means and think more of impact and happy people. Indeed. 
So for the last question, please raise your hands. Yeah, I see you. We'll pass in the microphone shortly. Thank you for this very interesting discussion. I would be very interested to hear the views of the group, uh, of the panel, on the links between rising levels of inequality in societies and decreasing levels of mental health. Thank you. <laughs> I, I will happily start on, the, on that. I think it's an extremely interesting, resonant question. Um, no one is going to say that there is a direct, inevitable link in all kinds of ways, but we can see in many countries how extremes of inequality um, and people struggling at the lower end of that inequality and a sense of unfairness and a sense of immobility. If you have all those things, it absolutely contributes to mental ill health and more than that, contributes to uh, a degree of political ill health um, a degree of inequality may be helpful for some societies, but there are limits uh, many societies find um, beyond which there are strains on how society and politics work. And I think you've seen many, many countries run into this. I don't regard this as a, a grand political statement, but one about observing countries. So I was thinking as the others were talking in response to the previous question, Part of the answer to this is about recognizing mental health and the problems and giving more priority to that. But part of it is also about tackling the problems of the many-sided crisis that this session is about and actually trying to resolve those problems. And for many countries, the inequality you've described and the things that flow from that are one of those problems and need to be tackled. Thank you. And, yeah, if I may add on this, and definitely... I agree with everything that Brian just said. The evidence on that is increasing. We have more and more evidence that countries with high level of inequalities are scoring worst in mental health. Um, and we have this evidence over the years. So we can see that neoliberal, more neoliberal societies have higher level of inequalities. And this is tying with the increase of mental, of poor mental health and mental health conditions. Please give your big applause for our speakers.